All right, fantastic. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tobani. I'm mostly going to be taking care of the tech, tech side um, to today's um, important book discussion and conversation. Um, we have Professor, as you can see uh, from the screen, we have Professor Shadrach um, Chirukure, as well as Professor Yost Fontaine, um, who are going to be discussing um, Professor Chirukure's important book, um, Great Zimbabwe, Reclaiming a Confiscated Past. Um, so Yost is Professor Yost <laughs> Fontaine is gonna go first um, with his re recent response um, to the book. And then uh, Professor Shedrak is going to have an opportunity to respond. And then we're gonna open up um, to questions. So I'm not going to do the traditional academic thing of reading the bios because anyone who's watching this um, can now see it very clearly on the screen. Um, but um, um, over to you Yost, um, I think we can start. Uh, thank you, Kobani, and welcome everybody, and particularly welcome to Shadrach, um, whose important book is, is what we're discussing today, and it's great that you could join us for this. Uh, I say important, and it's important not just because Great Zimbabwe is important, now obviously I'm biased, but I think we all can recognise the importance of Great Zimbabwe as an archaeological uh, heritage site across the region, but also because this book engages with uh, very pertinent discussions around the decolonization of academic knowledge production and particularly archaeology and I I think that's why this makes for a, a sort of a broader discussion that I, th I think is of broader interests. Um, so with little ado I'm gonna gonna carry on now I was asked to review this book some months ago and there was a bit of toing and froing because the publisher sent the book to me when I was in Nairobi but it arrived after I'd left Nairobi and Shadrach, thank you very much for sending me the PDF of the proofs, because they then sent me an ebook which I couldn't print, and I read it in three days, and I didn't want to read it on my computer, because when I read fast, I can't do that on the screen. Anyway, so this was supposed to be a book review, and then as I started writing, it all kind of flew out, and it came, and, and you know, I just let it flow, and it became 9,000 words long, and I sent it to the editors of Azania, which is one of the leading archaeology journals for archaeology in Africa. And I said, I'm really sorry, you asked for 500 words and I gave you 9,000. Uh, will you have a look at it anyway and tell me what you think? And they did. And they said, OK, well, I think we can publish this as a review article because it raises some broader issues. And then it came out. So it's kind of amazing how quickly it came out. But it's nice because the book came out recently to have this discussion coming out quickly afterwards means that we can keep this momentum going around this, I think, rather important discussion. So Chirikure has produced a wonderful and important book here. Um, and I would encourage anyone to read it. And I think the book's successes really revolve around three kind of contributions that it makes. Firstly, he does a wonderful job of synthesizing recent and much older archeological debates about Great Zimbabwe and does so with uh, new data and, and, and informed by a lot of new stuff coming from new archaeological in investigations over the last two decades, some of which he himself has led. And in so doing, he offers us a, a wonderful up-to-date up and nuanced discussion of the history of Great Zimbabwe in relation to the broader region and multiple other African polities or, or social or political formations that pre-existed, co-existed, post-existed, Great Zimbabwe, uh, and also the, the broader landscape of, of southern central Zimbabwe in which it is located, which has been subject to a lot of recent work. And of course, internally, between different parts of Great Zimbabwe, between particularly the stone walled areas and the hitherto less explored but equally important uh, non stone walled areas dominated by Dhaka and mud structures. And that, that's really kind of the first contribution I think it makes. And the second contribution, which isn't really separable from, from this, is that this new synthesis uh, of past and current archaeological debates is very carefully engaged with what he calls native cosmologies. And I'm putting that in inverted commas, and you'll see why as we get further into this discussion. Native cosmologies and local ways of knowing. And in doing this, he, he makes very careful use of, of Shona language and concepts to critically and very productively readdress what was previously known or assumed about Great Zimbabwe's past. 
And I think this is enormously important, not just in a redemptive sense of reversing the long marginalization of local understandings and histories of Great Zimbabwe, but also, perhaps more importantly, for expanding ways of academically knowing a place like Great Zimbabwe and its many pasts beyond the normative straitjackets of firstly, Rhodesian foreign origins fantasies, secondly, professionalized archaeology that followed it, and more recently, the professional heritage discourses and management proceeds that, that really uh, emerged at the end of the 20th century. Um, and these are kind of three phases that really dominated the representation and management of Great Zimbabwe at different periods across the 20th century. Right. And so in, in, in doing this, this is also where the book makes its third important contribution, which is to further understanding of the deeply politicized historiography and management of the site and others like it, and the mechanisms by which other local understandings and other ways of knowing, and I'm using heavy quote, quotation marks again, how these local ways of knowing have been marginalized to the great loss of the wider human pursuit of knowledge itself. And this, the value of this third aspect isn't just um, the expanded parameters of what we can consider knowable about a specific place like Great Zimbabwe. Much more than that, I think it offers possibilities for rethinking how archaeologists and heritage professionals should approach many other sites across the world, right? And across, importantly, the arbitrary imposition of essentialized geographies of difference, north, south, east, west, developed, undeveloped, western, African, modern, traditional, etc. Which are, of course, these uh, essential geographies of difference were what the racialized disciplines of colonial science had imposed in the first place. So much of what is presented in this book is relevant not just to Great Zimbabwe, but to many other places, and maybe even everywhere. When I work on Great Zimbabwe, when I think about it, I often think about Stonehenge. And not because they are similar historically, but because of the historiography of those places are quite similar. And in both places, for example, a reassessment of how the monumentalist biases of 20th century archaeology had prevented credible understanding and research into the significance of the wider landscapes in which they are located. When those monumentalist biases were critiqued and reassessed and those landscapes explored, what you then get is a fundamental reinterpretation of both sides, right? And, and this, I think, is exactly what the promise of the decolonization of knowledge is at its most productive, right? A better, more open, more inclusive, less static, less obsessed with fixing artificial categories and mindless bean counting, more open to multiplicity, complexity, ambiguity, and to multiple coexistent ways of knowing, doing, being, and understanding. And not in one place, but everywhere. And there is a nice quote from Chiaguri in his book, which I think sums this up. You know, the, this promise is to bring to the fore different knowledge epistemologies to enrich our collective understanding of the past in varied and diverse contexts. So this, to me, is the great promise of decolonization, the decolonization of knowledge production. And I think in many respects, this book does a wonderful job of this. Now, of course, whatever impact this book makes upon those broader debates, it is always, to some extent, dependent on their success in the very specific terms, right? Um, and, and again, this book doesn't disappoint here. So, for example, the notion that Great Zimbabwe was continuously occupied in waxing and waning numbers and ways uh, long after its supposed decline in 1450 is so firmly established in this book that I don't think anybody will ever doubt it again, right? Likewise, through his careful synthesis of new studies of material culture, physical, the physical layout and new excavations at the site, all of which take place in engagement with deep insights from ethnographic understandings of Shona language and society, it is shown that social organization at Great Zimbabwe was probably based on relatively autonomous homesteads, each involving um, a whole load of otherwise specialized skills like ironwork, pot making and so on. And, and this is a, a very different way of looking at how uh, society was structured in Great Zimbabwe, which had than what had preceded it. And this has important ramifications for how we think about political structure at Great Zimbabwean society. Likewise, 
uh, the role of external trade, which was a hot topic in older debates, is also powerfully reassessed. And the prominence that was previously given to exotic material culture from China and the Middle East is actually very effectively nuanced here in relation to other trade links with, for example, Central Africa. Now, there's a lot more I could say about this, but those are some examples. And, and the result of all this careful nuancing is that simplified single cause explanations for Great Zimbabwe's long history of emergence, occupation, coexistence are firmly askewed in favor of much more realistic, much more plausible and much more complex understandings of what life might have been like in different periods of the site's long and continuous occupation. Now, I, in particular, I really like the, the work in chapter two, because this is where the book presents its elaboration of, of Shona language and, and concepts. And importantly here, all of this is very uh, carefully nuanced in relation to the large post-colonial literature, which long ago deconstructed the very idea of a, a consolidated Shona identity, culture and language, and the different dialectical groups under it as colonial inventions. So there is this careful nuancing of this. And yet at the same time, there is this wonderful engagement with uh, pre-colonial Shona practices and concepts, particularly I liked his engagement with Gerald Mazarige's work on pre-colonial notions of territoriality or Nika, and how he uses it to reassess how we can think about how people, land, territory, and political organization were intertwined during different periods of Great Zimbabwe's long occupation. And again, I would highlight this as a great example of the potential productivity of using different knowledge epistemologies to enrich academic understandings of the past. But of course, many people will read this book not just for those particularities about what it says about Great Zimbabwe's past. They will also read it for what it says about broader issues to do with the politics of knowledge cons uh, construction and, and production and decoloniality in inverted commas. And I think some of the ch early chapters are very important here for setting up what follows later. Albeit, this is also where some of my hesitations arise. So chapter three offers a, a critical biography of Great Zimbabwe from the 18th to the 21st century. And I think this is a long overdue chapter because what it does is it discusses in great detail the kind of gross damages inflicted upon the site, uh, both by early Rhodesian crazies. These are the white settlers who made up all these fanciful exotic theories about Great Zimbabwe. But also, and this is important, by subsequent archaeologists and to a lesser extent by post-colonial heritage managers. Now, this I think this chapter is really long overdue. And uh, although a lot of the a lot of the stuff about what the Rhodesian crazies have done, uh, the damage they caused, has been covered in the literature before. What becomes really chillingly clear in this chapter are the huge amounts of undocumented, unpublished excavations and disappeared collections of artifacts that were inflicted by the archaeologists after them, not the Rhodesian crazies. And, and I think this is really important because it really shows how everybody bears some responsibility and some an awful lot of it for the destruction of Great Zimbabwe's archaeological record. And, and I have to say it is a bit surprising that uh, Shadrick doesn't make a stronger argument here for the return of this looted material, much of which remains in other museums. I, I was surprised not to see a stronger argument there. Now, all of this is hugely important and quite overdue, but there are also a few omissions here, um, which I think are important. So one example is that there is no mention here of what happened to Great Zimbabwe under the directorship of its first post-independence black director, Ken Mufuka, uh, which was a really quite an important moment in the early 80s. And yet it kind of goes by without mention. Mufuka, for those of you who are not familiar with these debates, not only wrote a very famous but largely discredited historical account of Great Zimbabwe, um, but he also did things like trying to organize a huge festival of traditional healers and spirit mediums at the site, uh, which came to nothing, but there was a lot of literature on this in the archive. And he also began a period of renewed building, rebuilding of some of the walls, much to the alarm of his bosses. Now, Mufuko was undoubtedly uh, a controversial character. 
And yet all of these early post-independence efforts, however problematic they were, did have something to do with an attempt to reshape the historiography and management of the site. And that's why I, I think their mission here is surprising. I think they should have had their place in a book that's devoted to exploring what a decolonial approach to Great Zimbabwe might involve. So why, I wonder, this refusal? In fact, there's, quite a, there's not very much discussion in this book of post-independence management of Great Zimbabwe, which was a period when the professionalization of heritage continued to cement exactly the local exclusions that were first heralded during the colonial period. And I wondered to myself, why these deliberate omissions? Why these refusals? And I also began to wonder whether this dismissal had something to do with a similar dismissal in the archaeological debates of Tom Huffman's work. Now, I, I could talk about that a lot, and I think it will come up in questions. Um, but Tom Huffman was a, an, an archaeologist who's still writing, very famous, uh, very controversial. I'm more familiar with his earlier work from the 1980s, where he used a splattering of cherry-picked ethnographic examples from across the region uh, in a kind of ethno-archaeology and applied them historically to try and understand Great Zimbabwe's past symbolic significance and structure and so on. Now, if this is, Huffman's work is flawed, uh, and I think we would all agree with that, but one of the things that surprises me is how much venom there is in Zimbabwean archaeological debates against Huffman, because you could argue that Huffman was one of the first archaeologists to try and use local ethnography to make sense of Great Zimbabwe. And, and therefore, in a discussion of decolonizing, attempts to decolonize Great Zimbabwe, Huffman should maybe have a place. And therefore, I wonder whether the refusal to discuss Huffman is also linked to the refusal to discuss Mufuka. And maybe this is because both of these post-colonial moments or efforts complicate some of the essentializations that also sometimes appear in this book, which seem to derive from a need to buttress a kind of decolonial rhetoric weaved around the text. Uh, and this is, this is even more apparent in some of the discussions around different notions of time and chronology. So terms like the Western knowledge system, Western-centric colonial knowledge are repeated throughout this text and sometimes problematically. And I think this is very apparent in the discussion of time. So the discussion of time uses Fabian's very well-known discussion of how particular constructions of time were used in anthropology to distance and other their subjects of study and to deny the coevalness of anthropology's subjects. And this was a hugely important book in the early 80s which was part of a much broader wealth of post-colonial critiques emerging in at that time, the late 70s, early 80s, in anthropology and in broader subjects like literary studies, for example. And here, um, in this book, Fabian's argument is used to argue that the long history of exclusion of local histories or native cosmologies, if you prefer, in favor of the so-called Western knowledge system, really came with the imposition of so-called Western notions of linear and progressive time to the exclusion of cyclical and recursive Shona notions of time. And you can probably tell that this is where my hesitations emerged a little bit, right? Because the problem here is that it's not really clear that all Western notions of time are necessarily or always have been linear or progressive. In the academic dates that uh, debates that emerged in the 90s when I was an undergraduate student and a postgraduate about memory and the early critiques of heritage, one of the points that was very strongly made uh, and explored was how very particular linear and progressive notions of time had emerged as a result of developments in Enlightenment philosophy and experiences of uh, rapid urbanization, industrialization in the 19th century and then became embedded in academic disciplines of archaeology, history and others in the 19th century. Now what all this suggests is that therefore not only was time in the so-called West not always linear and progressive, in fact the imposition of linear progressive notions of time in those disciplines and later through the expansion of heritage, for example, was never actually uncontested but always subject to dispute, debate, critique in the West and everywhere. 
right? And the anti-monument -mon uh, monuments movement in post-war Germany is a really good example of this. Now, in short, even in the West, understandings of time have never simply been linear and progressive. And ways of dealing with them, including utilizing them deliberately or not for nefarious colonial or other purposes, have always been contested. In other words, there have always been many other coexistent and contested ways of reckoning with people's multidimensional experience of time. And reducing a discussion of how different notions of time have been imposed or subsumed or perhaps coexisted at Great Zimbabwe or anywhere else into a simplified, essentialized tension between so-called Western time and dominating uh, Western time, so-called, you know, dominating the time of native cosmology, not only risks repeating the simplified racialized dichotomies of colonial protagonists, it also homogenizes the complexity of time on both sides of this dichotomy. Now, in the longer article, I cite a really bizarre story of what happened at Great Zimbabwe in the early 20th century, when a bunch of Rhodesian crazies had a seance. Uh, and a, a European settler medium became possessed by various fictional characters from their fantasies of Great Zimbabwe's origins, alongside some Rhodesian heroes. So Richard Nicklin Hall, who was responsible for a lot of the destruction of Great Zimbabwe, actually appeared in this seance possess somebody and so now I can't it's a wonderful story the whole book written about it it's completely absurd but it's crazy but the point I make in the in the review article and I'm, I'm kind of emphasizing here is that this is an example that illustrates how very many different types of time and different understandings of time uh, coexist at the same time right and it reminds us that so-called Western time was always more multiple contested and contradictory than simply linear and progressive time which were embodied by modern disciplines of archaeology and indeed more recent archaeological work uh, suggests that even within the discipline of archaeology multiple ways of reckoning with time and with stuff and with the relationship between time and stuff in the past have always coexisted um, and after all and this is an important point to paraphrase Latour no one has ever actually been modern, right? So look, you can see where my critique is emerging. And some might argue that all of this is just semantics and that given the kind of weight of colonial history and the continuing uh, qualities of the academy, which are uh, very apparent, you know, perhaps using generalizations like Western knowledge or Western time is justifiable. Maybe, perhaps. But I think the real danger is that if Western knowledge is being essentialized, then so too are claims about so-called local or native cosmology. Um, so, for example, when applied to the contested historiography of Great Zimbabwe and the long exclusion of local communities, their histories, their knowledges, terms like native cosmology are actually far from neutral. This is because questions of who is a proper local or a proper native, and therefore whose past and whose knowledge should inform the representation of the site are, are deeply, um, deeply contested. Okay, I'll try Kobani, sorry. Um, that the fact that the Neymama people themselves refer to themselves, and one of their praise names is Vameri, which means those who germinated here, is itself a deeply political act, as are their rival clan, the Mugabe clan's claims that they buried their ancestors of those at the site. Both these sets of claims assert completing histories of belonging, but they also exclude others. And they don't just exclude Western Northern scholars and heritage managers, but they also exclude other natives from the region, from the country, and more importantly, other locals, right? So, Furthermore, such local contestations over autochthony exclusion are not just relevant in terms of the custodianship of a heritage site like Great Zimbabwe. They're also intensely salient in the politics of land around it. So these complex, contested local aspects of the historiography of Great Zimbabwe, I think, question the usefulness of theorizing in terms of an essentialized dichotomy between Western knowledge versus native cosmology. There is, in a sense, another kind of refusal going on 
when intense local politics are subsumed under assertions of a centralized native cosmology. And I think it's interesting, however, and I was a little bit disappointed, actually, that there are relatively few local voices in this text. When I worked on Great Zimbabwe 20 years ago, I spent hundreds of hours talking to mediums, chiefs, headmen, etc. And I was really hoping that in this book I would get a, perhaps a deeper understanding of all the things that they were telling me. But apart from a few quotes of here and there, a few proverbs from Oliver Mutukudzi, we all love Oliver Mutukudzi, and a few anecdotes from local chiefs, there are surprisingly few voices here. And for a book written about writing within a kind of decolonial framework, it really surprised me how few local voices there were. And therefore, there is a sense in which the reader is expected to take on the author's claim to be the authentic native voice. But this is never fully explored or explained. Now, given the long history of the dominance of Europe by European and Northern researchers in the right and great Zimbabwe's past, it is unquestionably important that the archeology span of Zimbabwe is led by Zimbabweans, which I think it now is. But I'm not sure if this is enough to justify the essentializations about Western and native cosmology. So with so few local voices, on what grounds are readers to assess the book's claims about native cosmology? It's interesting to note there are also little discussion of other kinds of African claims over Great Zimbabwe. For example, long-standing vendor histories, or those of the Varemba or the Lemba. Apart from the problem of essentializing notions of Western local or native knowledge or cosmology, there is also a question about whether African archaeology really is as Western as such simplifications suggest, or whether that is even a useful way of understanding the history of archaeology itself. Over the last couple of decades, there have been a number of attempts to deal with this difficult question. So there's a, an edited collection by Wine Jones and Flesher, for example, which explores how 20th, how 20th century archaeological research across the continent, including by African researchers, made very significant contributions to the development of mainstream archaeological theory, even if the contributions of African scholars were sometimes left very problematically unrecognized. Likewise, some of the papers in de Jong and Rowland's collection called Reclaiming Heritage looking at how museums, heritage and commemoration across West Africa has long been transformed into new locally, locally meaningful forms and practices. Also point to this question. The point here is whether it's still possible to describe archaeology and heritage as they are materialized and transformed across African continent today as simply imposed forms of Western knowing. Or might such assertions lead to new forms of silencing, new forms of refusal, of the long engagement of African thought, practices, skill and knowledge in the constitution of archaeology as a discipline and in contemporary heritage. And would this not amount to an equally problematic denial of African agency, knowledge and creativity akin to the long era of local exclusions at Great Zimbabwe? Can we still say that archaeology and heritage practices are simply powerful reproductions of Western knowledge? Or might it be more productive to think about how archaeology itself has always been transformed through its engagement with local African social, cultural, political, and yes, cosmological contexts? Just as imported glass beads in Great Zimbabwe's archaeological record were also reworked physically and symbolically into African forms and meanings through African craftsmanship, which is the subject of one of the great chapters in this book, chapter eight. So many readers might be left wondering whether theorizing in terms of a polarized dichotomy between imposed Western and authentic native knowledge systems is really the most productive way to proceed. Just as, to give another analogy, criticizing African forms of Christianity as Western or colonial long ago lost its traction. Now, the book does engage with this problem by making an argument that about the mimicking of Western knowledge by African scholars. But I, I found this a little bit disingenuous, not only because this book could itself be accused of doing that. Um, it might also, I think, under, understandably, anger academic colleagues to be described as colonial mimics or lackeys of Western knowledge. But this argument is also based on a misunderstanding of Homi Baba's work on, on the ambivalence of colonial mimicry, which it cites a lot. 
Clonal mimicry in Baba's analysis is about being the same, but not quite. And it's in the slippage between the mimic and the thing or person being mimicked that there is space for authenticity, for resistance, for other versions, for other possibilities to emerge. And I think it's a real shame that this aspect of the notion of mimicry isn't discussed because it might have offered a way out of replicating exactly the kind of essentialized notions of difference that have too often marked decolonial debates of late. These are not new issues. Closer attention to the work of previous post-colonial scholars would, I think, assist these more recent decolonial debates and prevent them from falling into the rather obvious trap of replicating the very same essentializations of the very colonial discourse that we are all trying to move beyond. So I'm going to conclude now, and I hope I'm still within time, Kulbani. Sorry if I'm a bit late. So aside from these books, important successes, which are substantial, there is a but. There is always a but with a single T. Great Zimbabwe is potentially a very good subject for a book uh, about the decolonization of archaeology. And if decolonization promises to bring to the fore different knowledge epistemologies to enrich our collective understanding of the past in diverse contexts, then this book does offer wonderful examples of how previously excluded knowledges, ideas, languages, meanings, practices can transform, thicken and enrich archaeological knowledge. But there is also an ambivalence about the rhetorical infrastructure of many recent debates about decolonizing knowledge, which do find echoes here. While the promise is often emancipatory and progressive, too often there is a rarefication of simplified essentializations of different, which threaten to repeat the same racial, cultural, nationalist or geographical essentializations that colonial science had introduced and concretized in the first place. And Chirikori's book carries this ambivalence between what we might call a progressive and regressive kind of decoloniality. And that's where the title of my review came from. So I'm going to stop there, but I do want to quickly ask two questions, Shadrick, um, which have, have, have arised from, from my reading. One is, I really want to understand why Zimbabwean archaeology is so obsessed with critiquing Huffman. I mean, it's kind of obvious why his work, particularly that from the 80s, is flawed. Uh, I think that's obvious to anybody reading this stuff. But why is there is this obsession with Huffman? Because to give the guy some credit, he was trying to do something different at a time when few others were. So I'm trying to understand why Huffman has been critiqued so much, particularly if we also put it alongside someone like David Beach, a very famous historian of pre-colonial Zimbabwe, um, who everybody knows was working for the uh, special branch, the Rhodesian Special France during the war against African nationalism. So why does Huffman get all this abuse and Beach somehow get let off? That's the first question, and I'd love to get your insights on that. The other question is, and I didn't discuss it in this paper, but it's in the it's in the written paper, is, you know, to what extent are what we're talking about here very closely related to debates in anthropology around the ontological turn, which have really, uh, over the last two decades, you know, become a became a very big obsession, a very fierce debate, and finally, I think have finally subdued. But you know, this this ontological term um, was widely celebrated for its decolonizing ethic, um, but also deeply critiqued. And indeed, the main purveyors of the early approaches to this have actually um, retreated quite a long way from their initial points. Where so they no longer talk about other worlds or multiple ontologies because they've recognized that this is preposterously rarefying. That's a quote. So I, I'd like to know from you what you think that those debates in anthropology uh, have to say to these current debates in archaeology around the decolonization of knowledge. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm sorry if I took too much time, and I'm looking forward to your response, Shadrick. Sure. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Yost. Uh, Prof. Shadrach, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Yost. My um, the As I said, I mean, thank you so much for your very um, incisive comments. Um, very, very, very fair. 
but um, um, I'm not trying to um, deflect away from uh, from criticism. But one of the things that I made clear at the beginning was that um, this was an experiment, a thought um, a thought experiment. The question that I simply was trying to ask was that um, what happens if I use um, the experience that one got uh, growing up in um, southern Zimbabwe to, you know, rethink um, or think about the Great Zimbabwe and what it might mean or what it might not what it might not mean. And as with all experiments, you know, they do elicit um, different um, different responses. And uh, the other thing is that um, just on the general is that uh, some of the things um, we also respond to the very constructive uh, feedback that I got from uh, from some of the reviewers because I think in the very first uh, version I had uh, avoided the uh, tempering with the issue of time and, and and that came as one of the things that I need to that I needed to uh, to engage with and uh, I do agree that uh, it is still uh, very raw and um, and work in progress but nevertheless um, it offers an opportunity uh, to uh, think through. Uh, some issues. So um, I'll try to respond to some of the points uh, that you were um, mentioning, and also um, being alert to the to the point that um, the fact that we also need to have uh, some 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 discussion interactions with the audience would be would be lovely. So other than the village experience, the thought experiment in terms of uh, you know what will happen, right? Um, the other issue was just the, um, uh, the inspiration that one got uh, from from your own work, and uh, also from um, Gerald Mazarides' um, uh, equally brilliant uh, work. And uh, particularly, um, just you raised that question of um, ethnographic refusal when um, archaeologists are dealing with, um, with the Great Zimbabwe, and when Gerald Mazarides talked about. Um, the issue of Chishanga and the political dynamics in South um, in South Central Zimbabwe that also uh, brought uh, or provided um, a, a thinking canvas in terms of you know if one is to think about um, Great Zimbabwe and uh, what it means to present populations going back uh, into into the past if we are trying to combine all those elements. Um, what kind of new understanding um, can uh, emerge in all of uh, in all of this? So this is how I this is how I started, and uh, also of course um, I had to um, to shop around, and uh, also some as, as you pointed out in some cases with success, but in others um, not so much um, with, with with success. But the key point was just to. Um, initiate um, a conversation just to say, can we have uh, can we have a discussion around these um, around these issues? And you also raised um, uh, an interesting an interesting um, a point, which I don't think as academics in all uh, fields we are able to um, to run away from to run away from it, which also partly asks uh, answers the question. Uh, that you that you asked. So it is not that one is uh, trying to um, reify essentialized categories, or one is um, obsessed with uh, person X or, or person Z. But the the main issue is that um, anthropology, archaeology, and any other field, you know, these are cumulative uh, sciences. It's the production of knowledge is accumulative. You have to refer to um, what has been done uh, before, and then justify, you know, why what you are saying um, is, 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 you know, a step in the right direction in terms of pushing uh, the the academic uh, discourse and um, and discussions. So if that was not the, um, if that was not the problem, you know. If the reviewers do not say that, you know, you must cite Jus Fondain 
um, the silence of an unrepresented uh, past is, 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 you know, is a book that you must, is, that you must cite for, for argument's sake, you know. Then in some cases you can do away, you can do away with not citing, with not citing, you know, um, some, 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 some people. Or, you know, but, but that's, that, that's part of the, that's part of the academic um, exercise. And he, so people like Walter Mignolo might even argue that this is also part of the, um, the colonial matrix of power. In as much as you want to run away from it, you still have to refer to it, right? So what would be important is just to start afresh and, 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 and then, and then, and then, and then um, just continue and, 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 and do your thing and see um, what comes out. But then I wonder if that would also be uh, considered um, uh, scholarly. Yes, the point about uh, Ken Mufuka is, um, is a good one. And I do um, take the point that a, an engagement with um, archival um, sources was, 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 is, a little bit, is a little bit thin, simply because I was trying to strike a balance with um, and, and, and understanding at that um, your own work had done, although it's 20 years ago, but you had done a very good job in terms of, um, of raising those issues. But where there was no debate is with respect to um, the archaeological uh, objects, and uh, which is also linked uh, to, the, to the fact that um, the, the way perhaps um, that non-archaeologists interact with um, some of the work by, by Huffman, um, and, and, and the non-archaeologists would um, interact with that, perhaps um, there might be a slight, a slight, a slight, a slight difference. The challenge um, comes where, particularly in terms, of, uh, in terms of methodology, where the method which um, was being used by Huffman, if it was just um, using ethnographies and so on, um, that is not a problem. In any case, that's what Caron Thompson did. That's what, that's what, that's what um, all those, even Randro MacIver, they were asking people, you know, what do you use this thing? What is this? That has always been um, what Great Zimbabwe's um, discussions around Great Zimbabwe were about. So I, I don't agree that he, we can necessarily attribute that to um, to Huffman, because everyone has been everyone has been doing that. A major problem, though, um, which is both uh, conceptual and, uh, um, and, 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 and and interpretive, is this notion that uh, archaeology is a science. And 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 if you are dealing with a science, you first of all have to to um, come up with hypotheses. Then you test those hypotheses with the data. And when you have tested those hypotheses with the data, then you produce um, scientific laws or generalizations that you can then apply to each and every context. Yeah, I mean, context. That is what I am against when I write about, uh, you know, about, about, about uh, some of the writings which, 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 which Huffman has produced on, on Grace Zimbabwe. It's against that scientific method and the insistence that, for example, that Huffman 2001, the paper in the South African Archaeological Bulletin, which is talking about method and theory, and the, the other subsequent um, follow-ups to that, even what he is writing. The fact that there is out there, there is a person who holds scientific truth, and all the other in interpretations are inferior to that. So the person that holds scientific truth, um, it is their duty to then offer reconstructions of the past. And um, that person, um, that is him, right? So that is what, that is what, um, that is what we react against. That, he, look, this is colonial. Um, if you want to express it in a nice sounding way, then maybe that is neo-colonial. There is nothing uh, very, very, very helpful in that, in, that, in that approach, and I make no apology. In, in, making, um, in, making those, uh, in making those statements. What happens if there is, um, if we create an environment where we can discuss without uh, each of us saying, my vision of the past is more superior than yours, where we say, okay, let us put all ideas on the table 
and then let us have a discussion without this hierarchy in terms of in terms of knowledge production so that is where that is where things are, are come from but um i do i do take the point that he, perhaps it's not a discussion that is worth um engaging with and the result would be that um yeah one might actually not um, cite the work as he is uh, now he has started doing that he simply disregard that you know there are people who are doing who are doing work and try and revive some of those um, old ideas and, and so on perhaps that is the perhaps that is the way to uh, but that is the way to go but the issue is just that um, we all deserve to be to be had whether we are right or whether we are wrong we were not there when Great Zimbabwe was being um, was being occupied but rather let us have productive uh, debates uh, that are respectful and that also acknowledge uh, others as to be uh, knowing as to be you know in a position to add to these um, uh, discussions the issue of time is also very is also very important in the in the sense that in the scientific notions of the reconstructions about um, about great zimbabwe it is um, you know it is time you know for example radiocarbon dates is interpreted in a very narrow way for example just only using one standard deviation um, instead of two and also just taking uh, the median instead of the instead of the whole span so archaeology is a science and that is what has uh, promoted um, what you yourself used to call um, the ethnographic refusal because then it means that you are creating these artificial boundaries where come 1450 um, this is what um, the radiocarbon deaths are saying everything has collapsed there is nothing that is that is going on so let us end here and between 1450 and and and, and 1800 um, nothing is happening so 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 and that is also a very problematic way of looking at the past so in that sense then yes one has to one has to engage with them and i think i also uh, not to be defensive but um, i also made some mention of the fact that uh, drawing from uh, chris gozen's work that the idea of even uh, time and so on was also associated with the railways particularly in uh, the in the 19th century the need to synchronize uh, time and also when uh, kids um, you know that uh, poem seasons of miss and mellow uh, fruit the old autumn it's, it's talking about the a cyclical understanding of uh, of time so there is also that recognition but it's how as archaeologists we also um, forget um, that um, when we talk about the uh, archaeological time particularly radiocarbon dating stratigraphy as as, as 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 layers and so on um that is what even other writers in latin america in australia so clay smith and others they've also deconstructed that uh, that knowledge thinking uh, thinking through stratigraphically thinking through radiocarbon dates the limitation which um that uh, imposes in terms of understanding a time in a cyclical in a cyclical way but uh, the other points that you raise certainly they would be good um, in terms of um, they would be good in terms of uh, taking this work uh, forward um, in terms of uh, working on the concept of time to ensure that uh, to provide more nuance to ensure that those essentialized categories you know do not um, do not exist but the major archaeological problem is that when you talk of uh, precision chronologies when you talk of radiocarbon dates when you talk of stratigraphy there is uh, an inherent um, a linearity uh, in there so it's up to us to interpret that in um, non-linear in non-linear ways and such discussion is is is, is already um, uh, ongoing um, yes great zimbabwe is a contested place the Nemanwa people have got their claims mugabe has got uh, his own claims and so is everyone else including the archaeologists for example but the key issue is that he, i would flip that around on you just and say that don't you also think that he, it is also colonial that he, you have uh, one group which he just say which claims it on behalf of themselves and exclude and exclude the other people 
uh, going back to our earlier conversation, I'm not trying to be utopian here, but it is the archaeologists who are coming in, you fence off, and you say that um, this is now an archaeological site, and we have a right to we have a right to this. So local people are now saying, or the the, 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 the others are now saying, well, so this this thing is uh, perhaps important. Uh, of course, we knew that it was important. We knew that it was significant. But uh, we can also lay our own claim and exclude others, just as those guys were also uh, excluding others. Is there a possibility in talking about the Great Zimbabwe? Yes, it's a contested place, but where you know within that contestation, um, all the the communities they engage with uh, with the place or with the landscape in a varied and in um, in different ways. So dissonance is actually quite um, quite a healthy thing. But what is not cool, perhaps, is to have archaeologists saying that um, our knowledge is um, superior because we are applying the scientific method. So what Nemanwa is saying does not make sense. What Mugabe is saying does not make sense. And what those spirit mediums are saying, it doesn't make sense. How do we bring all that into a cohesive um, a narrative? That is also the a challenge. Uh, that I um, uh, that I had in terms of you know dealing with these uh, different data sets and distilling it to a point where you can still uh, take um, um, some uh, take home message and also this point I must also accept that um, in a review of um, of the same book uh, just Mile Mataga also raised uh, the the same point but he felt that he in terms of um, the meaning of objects and so on. Maybe that also required um, more in terms of the uh, local meanings, those voices that you mentioned used in terms of the spirit mediums and also the, uh, the other players. What do they think um, those objects uh, mean? But I think um, the, in terms of the experiment, I think that might be something that could, uh, perhaps that worked. In terms of just pointing to the to the direction that perhaps this is where we need to this is where we need to go we need to um, to think um, to think along these lines and uh, one of the things that he uh, used perhaps um, you might have noticed is that uh, if you look at uh, southern African archaeology particularly the Iron Age its engagement with the wider fields such as African studies um, is rather limited. You know, so dipping into um, that important work which you were, which you were mentioning. So that is also something that I realized, and then say, well, why am I not talking to um, to, 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 to to Gerald Mazari? Why am I not speaking to the issues that Jesus Fonden is raising? This is the same people. This is the same landscape. What happens if we combine um, all of this? And 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 of course, there are other limitations in terms of the length and, 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 and so on. But hopefully um, going forward, if there is going to be um, a second edition or something like that, that is a very uh, valuable uh, input uh, that uh, one could do, that one could, one could, one could, one could give. And uh, the, the cyclical nature of uh, knowledge production in the sense that uh, archeology, span anthropology being cumulative sciences you have to say so and so did this before you you put on your uh, you put forward your own thoughts and your own mindset. That's what what and when you critique that, that he creates what might be what you perhaps you were referring to as essentialized categories. I would be very happy if you have some suggestions in terms of you know how one might um, in a reality uh, go about. Uh, uh, go about go about that and i take i take i take the point about uh, about mimicry and 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 and, and that uh, there is the deeper side uh, there is the superficial side uh, and, and, and 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 so on but the key question that i can that i could ask is that how do we explain that as archaeologists are working at great zimbabwe and so on why is it that the interpretation of great zimbabwe is still largely colonial, even what our tour guides um, tell to the tourists and so on. Why is it that your own work um, 
is has not filtered into the uh, interpretation of uh, of Great Zimbabwe. That's 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 that's, that's the reality that we are that we are confronted with. So, and yet we are repeating what has been um, said by the colony. And by the way, the colony was not all bad. There were also other things uh, that were also that were also good. But how do you explain it? That he, uh, all the good work, he, all the spirit mediums, all the people that you engage with to death, none of that is part of the official narratives or official interpretation of Great Zimbabwe. In fact, if you were to go to UNESCO, um, the descriptions of the outstanding universal value of Great Zimbabwe, they still make references to the Queen of, uh, to the Queen of Sheba. So that's, 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 that is the reality that we, are, that we are working on. So sometimes maybe one runs into the risk of trying to, to swing the pendulum rather, rather too violently. But uh, my, 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 my intention was just to say to colleagues, hey, um, how do we take it that um, up to this point, the interpretations and so on, they are still uh, based on understanding uh, of the, you know, of, of the 1950s, of the 1960s, and of the 1970s, and in some cases of the, of the 1980s, what happened to work that uh, has happened um, since, um, since then. That's why I also say that even uh, when reclaiming a confiscated past, uh, myself, I'm also included in that. I also included myself, and I also included uh, others. So if there are people that might take uh, the issue of mimicry um, in the wrong way, that was, not my, that, was not my, that was not my intention. The reality is that um, none of the recent interpretation is factored in the official narratives of, uh, of, of, of Great Zimbabwe. I'm not, I don't know. Who is supposed to change it? Are we supposed to be the people changing it? And if we are the people supposed to be changing it, this is my attempt to show the to show the way. So if others can join can join in, um, the more the the more the merrier. So the issue of repatriation, yes, that is um, that is also a point that is well um, that is well met, and uh, again, which take us into very uncomfortable. Um, discussions. So, for example, you mentioned Huffman, but the objects that he excavated in the 1970s are in his own personal collections. They are in, they are not at Great Zimbabwe, they are not in the museum. So if I am to write that and say these objects must go to, must go to Zimbabwe, then he, people might he, misunderstand that and then say, look, you are bashing, you are obsessed, you are, you know. So the issue, and I'm now coming to um, I, 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 answering your question, why do we criticize Huffman and not Beach and, and so on? There is a layer of toxicity associated with, the, associated with this. If you have tried to write a, a paper or anything on Great Zimbabwe and he happens to have reviewed it, you could have so many things to, to tell. And I do have evidence to show that. In some cases, you are a poor scholar, uh, you don't know what you are doing, and 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 and, he, um, and, 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 and the like. So sometimes what comes out in the papers, it also it or in the book or somewhere, is also influenced by you know the context in which um, what others were, what others were saying, and 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 so on. So if 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 the if the atmosphere in which we in which we work was based on respect for, for African scholars, shall I say, and, 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 and others, um, and, and, and also then perhaps the relationship and the way in which people um, engage with personalities, engage with the data, and so on, would also be very, would also be very different. David Beach, yes, he worked for the, for the internal, for the Minister of Interior Affairs, and, 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 and so on. But no one is a saint. So, 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 but at least there isn't that toxicity where Beach is simply claiming that, you know, because of this method, because of this, um, you know, I have the sole right to, uh, to interpret this. And when you write something and submit to a journal, then, 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 then you are told that, no, 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 you are a poor scholar, my evasion is the only one, and, 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 and you can't access some of those. Uh, 
some of those collections and you and, and you have to follow a specific a specific so see this is crying aloud in terms of you know how can this playing field be made to be leveled so that the young the upcoming the old and regardless of where people are coming from in the world regardless of their race regardless of their sex they can be encouraged to work on great zimbabwe they can be encouraged to work on Mapungubwe without the fear of, of retribution, <laughs> right? And, 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 and if that happens, you will see that there is no, there is nothing like an obsession. I think he, people are very busy. They would not worry about he, some of those very, very crazy things, you know, as you also, as you also said, who, would, who in their right frame of mind would, uh, would, 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 would want, it's not healthy intellectually or, 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 or otherwise. But it's reviewers who sometimes say, ah, you have to engage with this, you have to engage with that. And I have used uh, a certain metaphor um, in a book that I'm writing at the moment that uh, they used to be this understanding that the world is flat. And, 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 and now the issue is that everyone is saying the world is a globe. We don't see geographers saying that he, um, it used to be believed that the world is flat and, and, and now, it's a, now it's a globe. So why are we being forced to, you know, through, through disciplinary practice to cite some of that? If we can get away with that, I would be uh, more, than, more, than, more than very happy. But at least he, for all his sins, David Beach is um, much better in the sense that uh, he is a pluralistic. He is open to different ideas. And particularly, he is also one of the senior citizens who is saying, oh, oh the road in which we are taking this discipline, yes, it's, 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 it's using, you know, ethnographies and the like, but it's using the ethnographies in the wrong way. So if the ethnographies have been used in the wrong way, the, the, the end product cannot be right. <laughs> Let us be clear on that. Then the other issue is uh, in terms of the uh, ontological turn and so on, as I said, uh, um, I, I, I am not so sure. As I started, uh, it, was just, uh, it was just a thought experiment. And uh, I do thank you very much for, um, for, the, uh, for your thoughts, for your insights. Uh, as I mentioned, Jesmael Mataga, Aishton Sinamai, and, 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 and many others. Um, you are raising very valuable points that um, that uh, I'm, I'm very much educated, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate that. But where I started was that um, what happens if I were to think about Great Zimbabwe uh, from the point of view of my of my of my village, and and and, and the, what will um, what will what 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 will come out, and 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 hopefully um, what the feedback that you guys are raising will allow me. Uh, to um, think about these things in more balanced ways and also hopefully uh, persuade others to also come up with uh, their own interventions or their own texts. There is so much to be said about, uh, about Great Zimbabwe and, 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 and other places. And this is just to provoke people to initiate the, the conversation to say, if we were to look in all sides, consider everything, perhaps where we will end up is different to where we are at the moment. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Shadrach. And, and Kobani has asked me to reply to, and I'll quickly reply to a couple of things and then we'll open up. I mean, I think, um, let me turn on my mic so you can see that I'm a real person uh, and, and I'm still here. I mean, I, I think you and I almost completely agree on almost everything, Shadrach, and, and I find that really reassuring. Um, and, and if this was, as you very modestly put it, just a thought experiment, I think it's been outstandingly uh, successful. Um, your engagement with Mazarile's work is really very powerful, and, and I found that really very good. Um, it, it's slightly disheartening, two things slightly disheartening, the fact that all this super sophisticated, nuanced archaeological work is still not filtering down to the kind of heritage and public representations of Great Zimbabwe is actually kind of shocking and disappointing. I mean, the idea that, you know, the World Heritage System is still referring to ideas about the Queen of Sheba is just uh, ludicrous. 
and, and really shocking because there has been so much new work. Um, much of it you discuss brilliantly in your book. And it's, it's shocking that this is not filtering through. And it, it seems to me that one of the problems here might be the relationship between, you know, academics and, and more public orientated um, information producers, if you like. And, and actually, you're right. I mean, a few years ago, I was about 10 years ago, I was asked to um, um, consult on, on that series, The Lost Kingdoms of Africa, which has a, actually a terrible title by Casey Hayford. I think that's his name. And I ended up being quite involved in this. And I told him to go and speak to some of the mediums like Abuya Fazarijo, which he did to his credit. But I remember I consulted before um, they went to field work. And I said to them, go and talk to these people. Talk to these uh, people. And, 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 you know, they brought Abuya Fazarijo, who sadly passed away in April this year. I didn't know if you know that. Um, two great Zimbabwe, and there's some great footage of that. But after the filming, they then produced a draft of the text. And in it, they also made mention of these um, crazy Rhodesian exotic theories. And I said, don't put that there. And then even the day, like two days before it went public, I got a, an, an email from a very senior person in the BBC saying, this text is very strongly uh, anti those Rhodesian theories. Is it fair to say that those Rhodesian foreign origins theories really were as nonsensical as you're arguing? And I said, I was really shocked that this should be coming from the BBC. I mean, obviously, they're trying to check to make sure that what they're putting out is correct. But I was shocked that this was still even a discussion. So I wrote back to them and I said, if you, in if you insist upon including those theories as a viable possibility in this documentary, then I want you to take my name off the credits. So you're right, there's still shockingly a very long way to go. And it is kind of, in a way, hugely disappointing how those weird, crazy Rhodesian ideas still seem to be half of what people talk about when they talk about Great Zimbabwe, when there is so much more to be said. And I think your book really demonstrates how much more and how interesting that all everything that hasn't been said yet is. Um, I thank you also for clarifying on the Huffington thing, and, and I, I think you really have clarified, clarified it for me now. The, your way of describing it as a layer of toxicity really, um, yeah, I wasn't really aware of that because I'm not so involved in the microarchaeological debates. Um, and it does sound like quite an unpleasant situation, and, and that does help me understand a little bit why there is this recurring um, sort of anti Huffman feeling well because he's sounds like he's personally quite responsible for some of that because he's quite an unpleasant character it sounds like and I also of course you know my work I mean I, I would 100% agree with you that the, the older ideas of archaeology as a science are very problematic and of course though embedded in those older archaeological theories ideas of linear time as based in in uh, kind of the role of radiocarbon dating and, and the really rather poor way in which that's been used. And I think your book nuances this brilliantly. But also stratigraphy and so on does lead to a dominance of a linear uh, idea of time in the, the way that archaeology does its work, or at least some archaeology does its work. But I guess my only difference with you is I don't think this is because of Western knowledge. I think this is because of archaeology. Uh, and, and so my hesitation still remains that the problem is the exclusion of other kinds of knowledge and the reification of certain very particular kinds of knowledge and the exclusion of other ways of knowing. That's the problem. Um, I don't know whether we can still describe archaeology as colonial. I think your work is very much archaeology and it's definitely not colonial. Um, so maybe where, where our difference lies is just in the way in which we describe the problem. But ultimately, I think we agree. The, the problem is the reification of certain very narrow and particular forms of knowledge over and above, and therefore the exclusion of all the wealth of other ways of knowing uh, places like Great Zimbabwe, which are incredibly uh, important and would be of benefit to the project of knowledge production generally. And I just hesitate about calling it Western knowledge. I mean, I think it could be colonial, at least post-colonial, in a sense that it's about legacies of, of, of the colonial period, 
sure. But whether it's Western, I'm not sure that I, I think that way of framing it distracts us from what the real problem is, which is the question of the politics of knowledge. And, and, and I think your reference to Mignola's work about the colonial matrix of power, the way in which academic discourses are always incredibly self-referential and accumulative, as you put it, which I thought was quite a nice way of putting it, is part of the problem here. Um, you know, should we start afresh? Uh, it's an important question because you could argue that all academic discussion, in, to some extent, is always appropriation. Um, and maybe that's just the way it is because it's a rarefied discussion. And we could counter and say, well, you know, one of the things that struck me when I was working on Great Zimbabwe, which I, I found really interesting, was the way in which these local discourses also appropriated academic discourses. So, for example, the way in which the idea that the Rojri built Great Zimbabwe, which is highly prevalent, but completely disputed by all archaeology, is actually based on much, much older and very scant and slightly dodgy oral historical work done in the 60s but has been profoundly disputed. But the fact that this idea is now so pervasive amongst local communities and local discourses actually reflects in a way the opposite, the way in which other discourses about the past, non-academic discourses, have also appropriated certain aspects of academic discourses. And I think that's interesting. And, and it does make us all think, you know, is, you know, all knowledge is politically situated. So how can we do academic work without some kind of appropriation and how do we carry on the larger project of of, of knowledge production uh, while paying careful and due attention and respect and recognition to other ways of knowing and that's then we're getting into the really nitty-gritty of it because i think the productivity of engaging with with opening up knowledge opening up ways of knowledge to other ways of knowing is wonderfully demonstrated in your engagement with with chana concepts via Bazarie's work and others. So it's brilliant. I, you know, I think we really are on a similar page. Um, what was I going to say? One more other thing. So I think basically to sum up, our only difference lies in whether we can still frame the problem as a problem between Western and African knowledge or, uh, you know, colonial knowledge systems and African native cosmology. I, I don't think that those framing helps. But where I think we agree is that the problem remains, which is to do with the exclusionary tendencies of certain dominant forms of knowledge and the need is to open this up. So um, I, I, I was going to say something else, but I feel like I've talked far too much. So let me shut up now and maybe we can open up. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you so much um, to the both of you. That was such a rich um, discussion. So we're going to open to the floor now. Um, so for the people who are new to Blackboard Collaborate, there's a there's two icons, three icons um, at the bottom. Um, on, on your far right, um, there's one that looks like someone holding their hand up. So you just click on that and um, it will allow you to, it will allow us to see who's raised their hand. Okay, fantastic, we have one hand. Uh, can we take three at a time? Uh, is, does anyone else have a hand? Going once. Okay, um, let's go to you, Tulani, first, and then um, feel free to raise your hand as well um, if someone else has a question. Oh, 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 thanks. I hope you can hear me. Thanks, Prof. Youst uh, and Prof. Shedrak. I agree with you relating to the polarity between uh, Western knowledge and African knowledge system. I think it's very parochial. On the other hand, I do not have a problem with single modes of knowledge because pluralism doesn't mean the story, if it's multidimensional, then it says anything about ontology. And the other thing, my questions are directed to both you, Professor Shedrick and Professor Yust. So the issue of decolonizing knowledge, does it have to do something with epistemology or we decolonize it because the producers were colonizers? Is that related to ontology or just pure politics? Thanks. Okay, thank you, Tulani. Um, is there anyone else before the professors respond? Uh, we can take two more. Um, okay, I think you can respond to that um, whilst people are still formulating their their, resp their responses. Shadrach, you go first. Uh, 
So, 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 so that's that's a very interesting uh, question, um, Tulani. I think you, there are a number of things uh, there. So we do not uh, decolonize knowledge simply because uh, it was produced uh, during the during the during the colony. No. So that speaks to the point that I was saying that uh, some of the in terms of knowledge production. So some of the advances in knowledge. Uh, in fact, the, the very, very, very important ones, uh, the archives and, and, and the like, they were also um, built during the, during the colonial period and by the colonizers. So, so, so there is that, there is that acknowledgement. Where the problem comes um, for me is that and where the issue of decolonization um, comes in uh, for me is um, some of that knowledge is not um, inclusive and uh, it excludes um, some of the um, communities, some of the um, stakeholders. So for example, um, whose voice is being, uh, is being had and whose voice is not being, um, is not being, uh, is not being had. So decolonization then uh, becomes um, a metaphor for an inclusive um, um, academic, um, intellectual uh, practice um, that is, um, if you may want, uh, that is open for all to uh, participate and to engage with. And decolonization then becomes um, an opportunity for a restorative kind of um, kind of scholarship. So what just was mentioning in terms of uh, of restitution, because some of these uh, colonial uh, practices and so on were extractive. And in the post-colony, we also perpetuate at uh, those extractive uh, tendencies. We go into communities, we take um, the information. Um, at the end of the day, I'm a professor, I used is a professor, but uh, what is happening to those uh, communities where we extracted our, our information? So decolonization then is all about saying, okay, hang on, the way in which things uh, were being done, perhaps, it disadvantages some other groups. How about uh, doing things in a certain way that is restorative and that is also um, empowering and uh, inevitably that also includes uh, issues of uh, ontology and also issues of, um, of, of epistemology, but um, under the umbrella of the need to be um, to, 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 to be inclusive and not to uh, to marginalize others by, by, by creating these hierarchies uh, that do not make much sense over to you used thank you thank you Shadrach and thank you to Lani for that great question I mean it's both about politics and it's about epistemology stroke ontology and the reason I usually use epistemology stroke ontology is because I think identifying when we're talking about epistemology and when we're talking about ontology is actually very difficult in practice. Um, and they are slightly separate, but they are also obviously connected. Now, on a political level, I agree. I mean, the decolonial practice, uh, the, the purpose of that as a metaphor for trying to push for a more inclusive academic form of knowledge production and therefore including people who have been excluded is definitely part of the story and an important part of the story and that's to me is very much on the political side of this um, and it is indeed restitutive i mean if you look at a place like great zimbabwe i mean the exclusion of, of all these stories is, is profound and, and as we've just heard it still goes on i mean it shocks me how 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 this is you know why are we still talking about Rhodesian weird crazy theories about grace. Why are they even part of the conversation anymore? They really shouldn't be um, It's so there is still a long way to go and there's also still a long way to go because part of the story is also the enduring structures of of privilege and exclusion in academic uh, In the academic realm, right? I mean the, the fact of the matter is there are still more scholars based in institutions in the global north writing about this continent than there are in, in on this continent. And this also pervades who gets published, who gets published where, and it also manifests in the kind of um, layers of toxicity that, that Shadrach was talking about. And that is hugely problematic. There's such a long way to go with that. Um, but in my mind, I think of that as decolonization light. 
And when I call it that, it's not because it's not important. If anything, it's more important than anything, right? But the reason, so the reason I call it decolonization light is because for me, that's an obvious starting point that we should all have already started from a long time ago. And it frustrates me that we're still talking about that, that there's still this need, and there is still this need. There's no doubt about it. But for me, the promise of decolonizing knowledge goes much deeper than that. And this is, again, where I think Shadrach's work really shows us this promise. It's so exciting, right? Because, for example, you know, if we, if we take decolonizing knowledge as opening up the possibilities of what knowledge even is, or what knowing actually is, then we open up academic debates and intellectual work to all forms of other intellectual work which have so long been excluded. So in my own work recently, I've started working a lot with artists. Now, I, it doesn't matter where those artists are from, but why I'm working with artists is not because of where they're from. It's because I think that artists often do intellectual work that is not based on language, but based on presence. Right. So they're making an intellectual work, not necessarily through semantic forms or through metaphors, but through metonyms. So I'm making things present. And I think that opens up a discussion about what we mean by knowing anyway. Is knowing always about writing? Can we know in ways that are not linguistically determined, but maybe felt through affect, through presence? And I think the great promise of decolonization and particularly of including other ways of knowing, such as in this example, the ideas of Nika, for example, or the practices of spirit mediums, for example, spirit possession, is that this opens up completely different conceptual universes. You know, if the past is something that you can talk to, if you can make the past present through a person and talk to them, so the past isn't this thing that's in a line a long time ago and dead and gone, but something that's active, that is finds its presence in the presence all the time, then we, we open up the possibilities of what pastness even is and what time is and what time does in, in the world today. And to me, that is the real promise of decolonizing knowledge, is opening up to different forms of knowledge, different ways of knowing. Uh, and, uh, that is, and that to me is a promise that speaks to a much larger uh, human imperative, knowledge production as a human project. And I think knowledge production is severely limited exactly by the exclusions that derive from the colonial era, but also derive from post-colonial era. These exclusions are not necessarily determined by race or by geography or anything. They're determined by exactly their exclusion which may be racial, but may also be otherwise. And that's why the comparison, for example, with Stonehenge is so important, because in Barbara Bender's work on Stonehenge, she talks about exactly all these other kinds of excluded knowledges, which might be actually, in her case, often determined by class, right? So uh, politics, the decolonial promise is both political, but it's also epistemological and ontological. And of course, the two intertwine. And, I think the example we talked about, about when local communities themselves are intensely debating who is a native, right? Actually, that's really interesting. One of the things that I've been kind of fascinated by is how, not just around Great Zimbabwe, but also in terms of land reform, it was how different groups would say, look, you can't know this land because you're not of this land. I was born here. My ancestors are buried in the land. So the knowledge that I had is not the kind of knowledge that you think you have. The knowledge I have is something that is profoundly ontological and is inherent to my very being and my material relationship, literally a material relationship to the land. Now, that to me, that including that in a discussion of knowledge opens up what we mean by knowledge in the first place. And that to me is profoundly exciting. And that is to me what the great promise of decolonization is. I'll stop there because I always feel like I talk too much. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for one last round of questions. So um, if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. But um, whilst I wait to hear from people, I want to ask a question. And my question is really a question of method. I'm currently teaching a course um, on ethnography. 
and I actually see some of um, the second year students here, so which is fantastic as your book was actually targeted as undergraduate students as well. And actually one of my students who's here, um, U Tamsanga Tami Singlezi, asked a very interesting question in class um, this week, which is really this question of, can we really use, for instance, because when I look at the book, it seems like you've still remained quote unquote traditional in sort of the kinds of methods that you've used, even as the purpose of these methods that you've used are actually for quote unquote decolonial decolonial purposes, right? And really, I guess the question I'm trying to ask is the, is the tension between, can we still use, quote unquote, the master's tool, right, to do work that is decolonial when we know what these methods themselves have done in the past in terms of representation and what you're actually trying to undo with your book? So really, I want to ask a question. I mean, it's specifically to you, but um, you also feel free to, to also respond which is then um, the, the question of how do we navigate as well, because a lot of the time we focus on decolonizing texts and writing the final product, but even the methods themselves, we don't really often interrogate themselves. We don't interrogate them as necessarily problematic or as needing, of, as needing also of decolonization um, in and of themselves. So I don't wanna be too long-winded, but really the question is around how do we also think about methods in new ways um, in this decolonial moment on and not just necessarily assume that they are absent of um of of of, of um the word is gone now of tainting as well but um i'll stop there i hope it made sense uh Marere, please feel free to to go i see your hand prof Chirukure, the, the the first thing is to is to say i'm, I'm quite disappointed that you've left uh, my alma mater uct for uh, for, for, for Oxford. So that's the first thing to, steer, to to put out there. I enjoyed sitting in your classes as, a, as an undergrad. And while I now research uh, legal uh, sociology, I am disturbed by you know, your statement on Hoffman and how his collections and artifacts from Great Zimbabwe are in his personal um, collection. And I am left wondering if there is something that can be done, uh, perhaps from an archaeological point of view in, in, your, in your capacity or as a, as, as a country, because I know we have recovered some of the soapstone Zimbabwe birds. And is that in the same category or this is something different? Because that is very worrying that um, our scholars do not have access to our own artifacts. Thank you. Uh, so if you are asked the two questions, you start with the easiest one. <laughs> so uh, uh, Mr. Maraire, Dr. Maraire, Professor Maraire, the the, the, the issue is that uh, I'm still with um, I'm still with UCT. This is just uh, an adventure, <laughs> a short time, a short time, a short time adventure. So I'm still I'm still um, um, I'm still a permanent employee of uh, of the University of Cape Town, which is why I still have uh, some of the uh, some of the titles are there. But the question that you raise about um, what can be done, one way would be to um, engage with the National Museums and Monuments of Zimbabwe and ask um, the director to, to write a letter, of, uh, a letter of demand in terms of uh, can we have these uh, objects back. And uh, also what might also be interesting is to find out uh, of all the people, including myself, uh, who has what in their, in their, in their collections uh, from, 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 from Great Zimbabwe. What might come out might be surprising and also and also interesting. And if everyone um, retains uh, the material there, then that would be very important in uh, keeping a repository for for future that can be uh, accessed by um, uh, people from all over and those who uh, who are interested in, in in that. So yes, restitution also at that level is a very uh, important um, important thing. The question of uh, can we use um, the master's uh, tool to uh, to free ourselves? 
uh, is a very is a very important one, and the, also the issue of uh, how do we uh, navigate um, around around that. There is a long, 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 long standing uh, debate. You might remember the the debates between um, um, is an old debate between Caroline Hamilton and um, and Terence Ranger in terms of uh, around the so when when Caroline Hamilton did that terrific Majesty and Terence Ranger he was talking of uh, the um, limits he was talking to about uh, historical invention and 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 some of the the, the the some of its consequences and and then Caroline Hamilton was saying. Uh, in terrific majesty that he, in some cases there are also uh, limits to to historic um, to historic um, uh, invention. So the key thing then is to say that um, we know what the problems are that he, this knowledge was produced uh, in this context, and these are the disciplines that we have. Um, so part of what we are discussing and part of our duty then is to um come up with um, a productive engagement with that knowledge with that um, database to ensure that we can come up with a knowledge that is empowering to um, everyone if not most people and that is also inclusive and that corrects for some of those um, distortions of the of the colonial of the colonial era and so on but also mindful of the fact that even if what we call colonial, it's also borrowing from the, from the local. So if you say ethnography, um, and, and, and if you have Ivan Shapera going to the, to the Squana to, to record, is this the local, is this these people who are you know, contributing this, this, this information? So why not um, ensure that we can still use the, the information, but just being mindful of the, of the limitations and also, as used was saying, um, we also need to avoid uh, creating these um, reified categories because if you try and find it, so Adipesh Chakrabarti's uh, provincializing Europe, for example, or, or, or Eric Wolf's, um, you know, um, Europe and the people without, uh, without a history, particularly his chapter is his chapter one. What is even Western knowledge? There's no such thing as that because it's also borrowing from, from other knowledge system, including the, including the African. So perhaps what we need to do is that, uh, what are the questions, what are the issues, what do we need um, to work on to achieve um, justice, to achieve um, equity, and, 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 and for society to, um, to, to move forward in a way that does not um, uh, exclude others and in a way that does not reify those uh, hierarchies of the of the colonial period, or that we seem to to perpetuate in the in, in the post colony. That's, that that is what I would do. And also, when I teach um, the, the the archaeology of colonialism, that is also a debate that I encourage students to to have. Let us critique the source. Let us evaluate it. But also, um, what do we learn from that? And how can we use that um, to improve um, the situation and to improve um, uh, circumstances and, uh, and, 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 and others? Can I quickly respond? I'll, I'll be really quick because I see a few more hands, which is great. I mean, Shadrach, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and and Maira, I also agree with you. It's absolutely shocking that Huffman has got this stuff in his own collection. I just think that's criminal, frankly. It's criminal and it should be, it's it's unbelievable, really. Um, on the issue, Kobani's issue about methods and stuff, it's actually a, a tricky question because um, at one level, okay, thanks, we've got a bit of time. I mean, at, at one level, everything that uh, we've been discussing is, you know, what what are the master's methods? I mean, if we're using them, we're, we've already made them our own, right? And, and we spent quite a lot of time discussing that earlier. I mean, archaeology, we could, we could argue, the, the way it, it does its work now, uh, in many respects, is already based on our African ways of knowing. And uh, just as, you know, um, Christianity, we can't say Christianity is now just Western and colonial. I mean, it's been, 
it's we, we, that would be a, a misunderstanding of of the salience of of many African forms of Christianity, uh, going back to the African independent churches and much more recent Pentecostal movements. So you know, methodology. I don't think methodology or even knowledge is owned by people, nor does it own people. I think knowledge moves through people, uh, and sometimes multiple knowledges move through people and we pick and choose things that we find relevant in any moment so sort of identifying methods or identifying knowledge as belonging to a particular group of an identity group is already problematic um and in the same way that shadrach wonderfully describes how imported glass beads were reworked physically but also symbolically into african forms actually illustrates that point um the master's methods are already the oppressed methods because they never really were the master's methods. So that's on one hand. And yet on the other hand, you know, one of the weaknesses or one of the problems that I endlessly see in some of the decolonial debates of our time is the rarefication of some of the exactly the conceptual differences of colonial science. For example, the idea that there is such a thing as African knowledge. Or that there is such a thing as Western knowledge. Um, I think that itself is problematic because it implies that knowledge is somehow geographically determined. I don't think anyone would agree that what we know is determined by our geography. Just as I don't think anyone would agree that what we know is determined by race. That sounds to me like what an apartheid apologist would say. So it's actually a very tricky question. Um, we don't want to reify colonial discourses and constructions, and yet at the same time, are there any methods that are not already our own anyway? Who owns knowledge? Who owns methods? So that was just my contribution, and I think your second year students should be congratulated for asking such an important question. Absolutely, and that student actually has their hand up now, so over to you, um, Tan Tammy. I'm so excited. I hope that my audio is not going to disappoint me. Um, um, hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Can I just confirm if everyone can hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Oh, OK. Um, I guess um, my question would be, so everyone has said such interesting things that I'm actually scrambling right now. I don't know. Where to begin to begin but um i just want to start by saying particularly for me the conversation around um great zimbabwe and um kingdom cycle like mapungubu is interesting because i think i'm interested in using it as possibly a blueprint for a post-democratic south africa and a post-democratic maybe native-led society because i think one thing that is interesting about great zimbabwe is the um, existence of autonomous states that basically not one central state like we have in modern day society but the existence of many autonomous states and i think that that speaks to a society that has interests and those certain interests being um directed towards um certain people i think to um to stop myself from scrambling i want to touch on what everybody said the central problem of this conversation is which is the exclusion of um previous histories and basically the exclusion of other people's perspectives, right? I think that that exclusion is very much motivated by the fact that we're still in a white supremacist society because it is a white supremacist society that um, basically excluded everybody and was colonizing everybody and led to the society that we are today. So I think because we're still in that society, we're never going to, I'm afraid that we're never going to be able to escape from these types of issues such as exclusion and being and having a long way to go in order to get to the point where we are because we're still very much in that white supremacist society so i just wanna that was basically my comment which is to ask do we think that the problem is exclusion or are there other factors that make exclusion possible in today's time because we are in a so-called post-colonial society but we're still experiencing the same issues that we experienced years ago in the colonial era fantastic thank you so much um tammy you're always clear okay one last um 
Okay, someone has just put a com comment. Thank you, profs. Uh, let me just see. Um, Elton, do you wanna verbalize your comment? Um, if you can, um, it's always great than if someone reads it for you. Okay, going once. Okay. All right, um, okay, sure, fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my voice is not uh, okay, so that's why I'd uh, written my comment. But uh, uh, let me try. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Chirikure and uh, Prof. Fontaine for this insightful uh, discussion. Uh, having worked at Great Zimbabwe for uh, over 10 years, it has been quite uh, an interesting uh, discussion to follow. Just a quick uh, question uh, in terms of how and who should address the existing disconnection that you have been talking about between the knowledge that is currently being generated by the academics and the way Great Zimbabwe is being uh, uh, represented to the general public. Thank you. Fantastic. Over to you, Prof. Uh, who should be, who should address the gap? Uh, it was supposed to be you, but then you left Great Zimbabwe. <laughs> On a more serious note, on a more serious note, the duty falls um, on um, on everyone. It's uh, it is our collective uh, collective responsibility. Onyaraz, you know that he, when we were excavating, doing work at Great Zimbabwe, we always raised these issues that there is need for you know the um, for redoing the interpretation of Great Zimbabwe, and also the question of why is it that there are no interpretations. Uh, um, or official tours that are given in Shona, or in Debele, or in any of the, or any in any of the any of the of the languages other than other than English. So it is us. We are the we are the people, and uh, maybe you you can provide some insight to us uh, whether the issue is about cost or what is the what is the issue, because the Justice Book is now almost as he said over. At 20 years, so I would have expected that he, we could uh, somewhere encounter Mbuya Zarira and, 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 and what her thoughts, what her thoughts are. Or Mbuya Sofia Mshini should be one of the, you know, uh, permanent fixtures in the in the narrative. So we are the people. We need to have that uh, that conversation, and uh, we can raise it up at the at the appropriate uh, level in terms of uh, saying that well. Maybe we need to shift things uh, in a different direction and to have this reflected in the in the interpretation. Um, Tammy's question was also um, is also a very a very interesting and um, and an important one. Where of course the the idea that you know we are now independent and 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 and, and that all the problems of the past, they are gone. We are now free, we are now, you know, I think it, it, is, it raises uh, quite a lot of um, problems. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, some of the challenges, particularly structural, if you are talking of uh, South Africa, the issues to do with inequality, um, differential access to education resources, and also which to some extent applies to uh, places such as uh, Zimbabwe and 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 and, 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 and and the like. That is why perhaps uh, this requires um, a constant a uh, dialogue and critical and critical uh, reflection. So the other thing is that uh, um, where I slightly differ with you is that uh, take a country like Zimbabwe. It's now 40 years after independence. Is it justifiable that you still blame the colony? For, 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 for 40 years of, you know, what, 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 what have you been doing? Or for, for, for South Africa, how many, how many, how many years? Yes, we can, uh, the structures of power, the skewed, you know, distribution. And by the way, uh, apartheid was a very horrible, it was a terrible, it was a terrible uh, system. But what are we doing with the emerging class of uh, black middle and, and, and upper classes? who you might remember that comment from one of the uh, famous South African political commentators, that it seems that in fighting for independence, 
uh, some of these nationalists, what they wanted was to be in the position which the former colonizers had. So in other words, if you were denied an opportunity to drive a car, what you wanted was to drive a car. So that's what those guys, they are now in those positions. That's why nothing is, that's why nothing is changing. So I guess what I'm trying to do is to introduce another layer of complexity, just to say that this is now um, a very, uh, a very complex situation. Yes, we must be alert to the to the legacies of the of the colony, and and and, and how it continuously uh, limits or restricts uh, people's ability to express themselves um, and also to even achieve a justice. But equally. We must also be alert to the fact that in some cases it's now us who are in those positions and the question then can be what are we doing you know because some are even saying that uh, there is this tendency to you know you involve you, you are involved in corruption in a misappropriation of resources and then you blame the colony but is it the colony that is looting is it the colony that is you know so we also have to take um to be accountable at some point and say that now is 40 years after independence, let us change the interpretation of Great Zimbabwe and, and, and learning from everything that has gone before. And now it's so many years after South Africa's uh, independence, this is where we should be as a society. Independence was meant to even uh, correct uh, those, uh, those things. So if independence is not working, we need to change the formula. We need to, you know, think of other of other options. Maybe the people who are there are not fit for the job, and 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 and, and for some, those are some of the explorations that we can think about rather than always blaming the colony. Yes, the colony was problematic. I take that point, but also, are we accountable for our own for our own failures and 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 and, and so on? Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I agree with you, Shadrach. Uh, in relation to Munirazi. Munirazi, that was your job. <laughs> what happened? Um, but I, 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 more seriously, I actually think... <laughs> I actually, <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually think... Uh, um, so National Museums and Monuments in, in Zimbabwe is actually quite well placed. This is one of the reasons why I'm shocked we're still having this conversation. Because National Museums and Monuments is has up until recently been very well dominated by by very good archaeologists um and that's one of the great i think successes ironically of the post-colonial period it was how quickly between the early 80s to the early 90s uh zimbabwe developed its own archaeologists who very quickly took over the reins and and shadrick you are very much part of that cohort i think and who immediately started asking these difficult questions and, and really opening up the debate. And therefore, you know, it's it's kind of surprising to me that um, there are still these dissonances between what, what the archaeologists are saying and their much more nuanced and complex approaches dominated rightly by Zimbabwean archaeologists and what's being fed to the public. And, and, and I wonder why. And I suspect that maybe part of the story is that however... Uh, well conceived national monuments are and the people within it are are operating they are also still beholden to a political regime that often hasn't allowed them to fulfill exactly what they wanted to do and i think i actually have a lot of respect for national museums for holding on in such difficult circumstances for 20 years i i have a lot of respect for national museums for that and for continuing to hold their own as academics in that very difficult situation um and there is a wider point here, and this I think relates to um, Timmy's question. I mean, we live in a white supremacist society. I think I agree with you, and I and it disturbs me because I think I often say this. I, from when I was growing up in the 90s in the UK to now, I think the arrow has changed, and we're pointing in the wrong direction. I think there was a time in the 90s when there was still a long way to go, but things were getting better. Now I feel like we things are getting much worse. I think the arrow has gone in the wrong direct on the wrong direction, and this relates to a kind of global politics of of right wing xenophobia, which reappears in America, which reappears in the UK, it reappears in India, it reappears in South Africa. And one of the features of this right wing populism is exactly an anti intellectualism. 
so that the pursuit of global knowledge, of hu the human project, the humanist project of knowledge production is no longer respected. And, and this actually has ramifications in decolonial debates. This is why I think the post-colonial scholars of an earlier generation actually had an easier time because they could still speak to the larger humanist project of a common humanity, which I think sometimes the decolonial debates don't, which worries me. Now, as part of this kind of white supremacist society with the arrow pointing the wrong way, wrong way we need to recognize that there are many exclusions in play. Uh, many exclusions. Islamophobia. In India, it's anti-Islamophobia, anti uh, Islamophobia in particular. In, in America, a lot of it's determined around um, migration and refugees from Latin America. Thousands of people dying in every every month in the Mediterranean. These the, the structures of exclusion are not quite the same as they were 50 years ago, but they are still present. And I think the arrow is pointing in the wrong, di wrong direction. And for all of these reasons, what I refer to as decolonization light, i.e. challenging structures of inequality in every sphere, economic, but also in who gets to publish their work in academic realms, is still the most immediate and most important and vital question. There's no question about that. And it frustrates me that it still is. Because what I really want to get onto is the much more, I think, interesting and, and positive dimension of this, which is opening up what knowledge is. The larger promise of decolonizing knowledge is still what we should be aiming for, even as I recognize that the immediate problem of dealing with structural inequalities is still the more immediate need. And that's why, I don't know if you were around in our earlier pre-seminar chat, but that's exactly why I sometimes think of myself as a pessimistic opt um, utopianist. I still think we should aim for the utopia, even as I recognize that it's in some ways it feels further away than it ever was. And therefore, we still need to deal with much more immediate structural issues. But I still think we should aim for the, the bigger problems. And I'll stop there. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much um, to the profs. I'm just going to again put you on the spot. Uh, we have about two minutes left. So if you can just close us off um, with just short one minute briefs um, or conclusions, what do you want us to take away um, from this conversation, from your book and certainly from your review, um, yours? So um, since you just spoke, I'll, 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 I'll actually make the, <laughs> the author of the book the first person to go and then yours, you can you can also use that to close us off. Thank you. Um, not much from me except to say that uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to um, all the to all of you um, for coming and also for the uh, questions uh, that were that were raised. Uh, very very much um, engaging. You have given me uh, and hopefully I hope um, all of us uh, some food for thought. Uh, some of the issues to engage with as we go as we go along the tensions between you know you are in the uh, post-colonial and you are still working with the colonial and as just was saying um, you are the, the issue is that you are also working in a world which seems to be um, are regressing in terms of going more uh, towards white supremacism and, and 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 so on. But at the end, at the end, at the end of the day, um, the issue here is that um, how do we continue to uh, produce knowledge in ways that are going to empower the communities where we come from, the communities that we uh, interact with. And um, regardless of the of the challenges that we um, that we are confronted with, and also avoiding some of the things that we criticize others for doing, that he so and so does that, and we also find ourselves um, are doing the same doing the same things. So the for me those are some very uh, interesting things, and just to say that uh, the conversation perhaps um, should also continue. 
at uh, Great Zimbabwe, as Tammy said, at uh, the Mapungubwe, and also in other places, in anthropology, and in other and in other disciplines. It would be great to have uh, such a very fruitful um, conversation that is uh, interdisciplinary and that is not, um, you know, siloed in our in our compartments. You know, I'm a sociologist. I'm an anthropologist. I'm an archaeologist. How do we uh, tackle knowledge in such um, an integrated way? That is something that would be uh, great if we can manage it. And thank you so much for being part of this conversation. And, and let me, in my closing statement, first thank Shadrick for not only taking part in this great conversation, and, and I hope we will carry this on in the future, but also for producing what is really a wonderful book. Um, and, and a wonderful example, I think, of what a progressive decolonization can be, what it can achieve. So that is one, and the other thing is, you know, this question, how can we avoid what I have called loosely a regressive decolonization? And I think what that really means is how can we avoid the politics of the now and hold on to the larger promise? Uh, because if we if we don't hold on to the larger promise, then, then we end up just being sucked into this very regressive politics that's pointing in the wrong direction. And I think we, we, we must all do better than that. And, and so... Thank you, Shadrach, for, for showing us a way forward. And thank you, everybody, for taking part in this really interesting conversation. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. We had such a wonderful turnout. And um, as I said, we're going to put this up on our YouTube channel if anyone came late or or they missed the, the, the conversation. Um, have a great evening uh, for evening, afternoon, wherever you are.